guys, welcome to Chatting with Asians. On this episode, I chat with acclaimed chef Jenny Dorsey. You might have seen her on Food Network shows such as Beat Bobby Flay and Chopped at Home, but she's also known for so many other projects. She runs her pop-up dinner series called Wednesdays, has numerous essays and articles that have been featured on sites like TechCrunch and the Huffington Post, and has collaborated with companies such as Pepsi and Harper's Bazaar. Her latest venture is combining food and poetry with VR technology with her project called Asian in America. But what makes her journey so interesting is the fact that she used to work in management consulting and was on her way to become the youngest MBA candidate at Columbia Business School before enrolling into culinary school. We talk about her career switch, the complexities of Asian American food culture, and dealing with family expectations when you're exploring non-traditional career paths. So here's my chat with Jenny Dorsey. Thank you so much for taking the time to be on my podcast. Yeah, of course. When I saw your website, I was really stunned <laughs> with the amount of work that you've been doing. Oh, thank um, you. To run a nonprofit, host a pop-up dinner series, and then run a podcast and working on a line of ceramics. How do you have time to juggle all of that? Plus being a speaker and a writer and exploring AR and VR. I think I've just been slowly trying to migrate my interest towards what I do. And so I, the way I think about it is like, I have things that make money and things that don't, and I need to have enough of a balance to make enough money so I can pursue like my artistic uh, things. And Mm -hmm. if I can just keep increasing and minimize the amount of time I need to do to make money, but make more money while doing it, then I can have more time to do art related (laughs) items. (laughs) Um, so I feel like that's like the big thing I've been trying to do this year and like just trying to like maximize like before I start any new project or do any new thing just being like is this a a, a good use of my time Um, and yeah I I don't know if that really helps but I think just like being able to say like think about all the things I want to do and be like I'm going to prioritize wanting to do these things versus some of the other things that um, other people care about like I don't work out as much as other, I try and work out a little bit every week, but like there are sacrifices that have to be made. So just being able to be like gentle with myself and like let, being able to forgive myself when I can't do everything at once all the time. I mean, I feel like I'm also in the same boat and I don't know if this is like an Asian American thing or not, but I also tend to have a lot of different projects in my life to kind of manage and oversee. And then at some point I do realize, Ooh, maybe I put too much on my plate this time. <laughs> and like, mm-hmm say no to projects or at least like put them off on the sidelines for later it's really hard i mean I, there's a good tony robbins quote um from one of his numerous books um, and it's like i mean this is the, his books that say the same thing like just in different ways <laughs> and then he makes like five million dollars um but anyway it's about like as you get better at your craft you're gonna have more opportunities and what you need to figure out is like which opportunities are worthwhile and like mm-hmm. i I feel like at first I was like, I, I'm not even good at my craft. Nobody wants to, to hire me. But now I'm like, no, I, I am good at what I do. But now I need to think about like, who do I actually want to work with? And was that kind of like a mentality that you had, especially moving from like management consulting and doing your MBA into culinary? Or were you still kind of like learning the process and freaking out every once in a while? Yeah, I mean, I think I, I have like a, cri- a like a life crisis like every two years or so. <laughs> it's like an ongoing crisis, I think. And I think that's a good thing because if you're like not having those crises, you just get one large crisis when you're like 50 and you're like, I actually hate everything I've done in my life. You know and what I mean? And you buy like the Mercedes Benz or the right. Tesla. Right, <laughs> yeah. And then you buy shit to fill like a hole in your heart that can't be filled with stuff or like get a trophy totally. life. <laughs> yeah, we've we've all seen those people. Um, yeah, no, I think I like manage this uh, this content. Like, it, I don't know if it's an Asian American thing or definitely for me. I also just have um, have always had issues with depression and anxiety. Is like this, like oh, like how do I how do I keep going? There's, it's never like oh, I feel I feel good now. Like I don't ever mm-hmm. feel this like just calming sense of satisfaction that I've like done everything I need to be doing. Like I'm always like okay, there's like there's more. There's more I need to do. Like, what am I going to do next year? For me, um, I, I have a birthday coming up. And every year around my birthday, I always get especially nervous being like, oh, what did I do this year? I didn't do enough this year. What am I going to do next year? Um, yeah. And so it's like trying to balance the 
the like positive side of that, which kind of keeps you striving forward and like the negative side of that, which makes you kind of like a nervous wreck um, mm-hmm. and always like perpetually doubt yourself. And I'm like definitely still working through that. Yeah, I'm also feeling the same way where I've kind of switched around between like accounting. Now I'm in marketing analytics and now I'm like, oh, you know, I still have this like itch to like do something a little creative. And as I'm approaching 30, it's definitely a side of me and a very much Asian American thing where I'm like, how do I explain this to my parents? Right, for sure, for sure. I mean, did you have to think about that when you thought about taking the sabbatical? Like, how do I explain this? And did that give you panic attacks? Or like, what was your process like dealing Uh, with it? I mean, so I don't have a really close relationship with my family ever since I um, left. I just changed careers. So, Mm -hmm. like, when I first changed careers, I still was talking to them relatively frequently, and I think, uh, like, they just didn't understand what I was doing. They never, they didn't understand why I wanted to go to to culinary school at all, and Mm -hmm. were really not supportive of that. And I think for the next, like, two years or so, when I was still kind of feeling out the food industry and figuring out what I wanted to do, um, Mm -hmm. it became this thing where they just kind of pretended it didn't exist and yeah. so it they would ask my husband all the time like what is what was he doing because he's in startups and he's been at you know fancy startups that people like to always ask questions about so it was like easy for them to kind of deflect and it kind of got to a point where it's like you don't seem to care what I'm doing so mm-hmm. I don't need to be in this relationship um yeah. it's big it, this relationship is a lot more destructive than it's helpful and there's just it became to a point where it's like, I can't live my life for you guys anymore because mm-hmm. there's, there's so much of that from Asian Americans, um, from especially I'm a first generation and my parents moved to the US uh, right after I was born and then I joined them a few years later. And mm-hmm. there's so much in their lives, I think, that they wanted to do, but they weren't able to do it because they gave up. You know, it was a different time back then. You had to have kids young and all this stuff. And Okay. They sacrificed a lot and I'm not denying that, but at the same time, like so much of that pressure is then put on the kids because you want essentially the kid to live the life that you couldn't have. And like, mm-hmm. no one is happy doing that. It's just a lose-lose situation for everyone. There's so much resentment on both sides. And I finally was like, you know, if I die angry and unhappy, like I'm the only one who has to bear that pain. They don't have to bear it. And like, yeah. I don't want to live like that. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I stopped talking to them, like, two years ago, two years ago. Um, We just started, like, vaguely emailing back and forth, but, like, I haven't seen them in, like, a very long time. So Mm -hmm. I just consider it, like, not, um, you know, at some point, I'm sure we'll try and, like, rekindle our relationship. But honestly, I've I've spoken to a lot of Asian Americans about how to deal with this. And I, I maybe this sounds harsh, but it's, like, their problem is not your problem. Yeah. And it's part of our like Asian American upbringing, like children's are kind of the faces of the family, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's all about saving face. Exactly. And like every time you go to like a big family dinner reunion, whatever it is, right. I mean, the only thing that ever gets talked about is like, oh, so like, what is your cousin doing? Oh, so what is your niece and nephew doing? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It just becomes kind of a comparison game and like knowing the expectation of going to this family dinner and being like, okay, what's the status update of my life? What sounds good, right? Um, ends up being not really healthy as an adult, surprisingly enough. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's so much like there's um, so much comparison and there's this like vague feeling, I think growing up um, in Asian American communities that like everyone is essentially the same. And so you're always seeing like who grows, like who grows metaphorically higher, right? Mm -hmm. And farther. And it's like, you, it takes a really long time, I think, to realize that you're, everybody's really different. You're comparing apples to oranges. And some of the people who are the most successful, you know, on paper are just like the biggest fucking waste of space, like in Mm -hmm. the world. Mm -hmm. And like, it's just, it's hard. Yeah. I noticed that you had published your own articles on Hyphen Magazine and um, what was the other one? Oh, on Medium kind of not just revolve on like your culinary experiences, but like really bringing the emotions of your experience as an Asian American into your food, especially with your series on Asian and American, the symbolic three course menu. Mm -hmm. How did it feel to like be able to have the creative power to do something like that and to like openly share your experiences with people? Um, I think it was hard to really be vulnerable. I mean, 
my husband and I have been running a pop-up series called Wednesdays for the last few years. And the big thing is like, how do you push people to be really vulnerable and open with others? And um, although that was like what we always preach, like it's really hard to do that in practice. And what I learned through that process, like really taking an introspective look at myself and like my failings is like, you cannot ask people to do that if you're not willing to do it first. It's mm-hmm. like, I say it all the time and like people kind of are like, give me that like, yeah, that's great. Like look, but like, it's really true. Like, it's like, you can't ask people to share things with you that are harmful and painful and serious if you're not going to reciprocate. And if you want them to do that, you should probably be leading that charge. Um, and Asian in America is really kind of my um, way of saying like, you know, if this is something I'm serious about, if this is the brand that I care about, if this is the message that I want to put out into the world, then like, I have to go step up and like, actually do this first and say that like, I'm willing to, you know, deal with the shit that people are going to throw back at me. Because if I can't deal with that, then like, I don't deserve to have this brand anyway. You know what I mean? Like, I'm just like, spouting bullshit, essentially, which is what most Instagram people do. But like, anyway, that's a different story. Um, Like, it's just how, how, like, how do I actually like walk the walk? Right. And I think Asian mm-hmm. America has been really hard because I have dealt with a lot of like weird undercurrents of racism and just mean stuff for the mm-hmm. lack of better term because of it. Um, just, I, I think it's it, when you make people uncomfortable, you don't know how they're going to react. And sometimes mm-hmm. some people are so uncomfortable with being uncomfortable that they like react in these crazy ways. They say things or they're just, not no one's been violent thank god but like they just say crazy things or react in these like i don't know i uncharacteristic ways like even people that i know they're it's like they suddenly don't know what to do and i think especially in the u.s where we're trained to be um extroverts and we're trained to always be talking it's very hard for people especially when talking to um people who are of a major like you know of a very privileged background to actually just listen to you instead of like opining um so anyway it's been an interesting like psychological lesson learning how to deal with people who are rude or negative but I think for the most part the support has been way like overshadowed the negatives like I've received a lot of awesome messages and also face-to-face interactions with people not just Asian Americans but I think minorities from all different um races and ethnicities and even people who I guess that you wouldn't consider minorities like Italians or something from Italy and just like talking about um some of the shared experiences that they have you know they didn't necessarily have the exact same experience but like something very very similar um for one for example this Italian told me that he it really resonated with him there's a, a section where um I'm talking, it's one of the desserts and I'm talking about like, you know, feeling like you want to go to sleep and just wake up and be blonde so you can fit in. And he was talking about how he, that really resonated with him. And I was just like, huh? Like, you know, I was like so surprised, but yeah. at the same time, like, wow, like, it's like, these are all these universal feelings. And if we can talk about feelings and then understand like culture, I think as part of those feelings, I think we can be a little bit more kind and gentle towards each other. And I think it's such a really great initiative, especially like nowadays right? uh-huh, Just, uh-huh. it's nice that you're able to like give kind of like a safe vulnerable space in a way even if people do react negatively to it at least it allows for like more honest connections in a way and I don't know it just sounds like a really nice initiative during these times yeah I think it's especially now people are realizing there's just so much like inequity in basically everything we do and it's been you know trickled down and like it's it's just like a pervasive. Um, I mean, I, for one, I didn't even realize how bad things were when I, like, I look back to my childhood and I'm like, wow, I literally did not have like a single like Asian American, like person in a book that I could read about or anything, you know, like, I mean, I just, you just don't even notice. And so now that finally people, this is something that like the media and also just people in general are shedding more light on. I think it's important to like really hone in on it and be like, yeah, like, let's talk about this now because we can't just let it fall to the wayside or say it's, like, not important because mm-hmm. then, you know, who knows what will happen. Um, yeah, so I, I think this is, like, a, the right time to really <laughs> actually focus on this. Yeah, exactly. Kind of speaking about Asian American figures, do you personally have any culinary figures that are Asian American specifically that you admire? 
Um, I wouldn't say like Asian Americans in food. Um, I, I'm a big fan of Kristen Kish. Actually, I was just looking at her Instagram today. Um, <laughs> she's like probably my favorite Asian American. Um, and she, I mean, she's Korean, but she was adopted by uh, a white family. So I don't know if that like doesn't make her Asian American or something. But um, yeah, yeah, I'm a big fan of her. A whole episode of that, right? Exactly. <laughs> That's like a whole right. So um, no, I would say I think she's fabulous. I think she's just like really she's just a very genuine person and I appreciate that I feel like she does what she says she does and she's like look at me like this is what I do and I'm I'm like I stand for queer women and so I'm gonna actually like do these events with queer women in the community and foster that community like she I um I'm friends with these two women who run like a queer supper club here in New York and they reached out to her and like they're just a small business and she was like yes I'll do it like you know for a big name like her to do something like that's because she actually gives a shit so like I really respect that oh here's a kind of like a fun question if you could cook a three or five course menu for anyone dead or alive who would you like to cook for oh I was just talking to um Tribeca Film Institute about this and I was like Michelle Obama but I have like no idea what kind of food Michelle would like besides like it would be healthy right because that was like her whole thing (laughs) like lots of vegetables um but yeah I would love to cook her something and like I don't know, just like be able to like talk to her and then get, like learn about the a topic she cares about and do kind of more of like the food art, like interpretive stuff that I do where, um, you know, like give her one of the, I don't know if you saw, I think in one of my essays, I was talking about this uh, plate that's like plated in a lunchbox and it's about like the shame around lunch, um, lunchtime routines, like give that something like that to her and like talk about it because mm-hmm. I feel like she would be into it. Moving into lunches. I, I don't know about you, but I've well, I've had personal experiences where my mom would cook me like Chinese greens, rice, and like soy chicken, which doesn't sound like crazy insane to me, but I have gotten remarks as a kid like, oh, your food is kind of smelly or it's kind of weird. Mm-hmm. Like, what is that? But nowadays it's like, I think because of like social media and like celebrity chefs like David Chang, more people are now like, trying to be open about Asian food, right? Because that's the new culinary frontier. So all of a sudden you get people who are interested in dumplings and bone broths and pho or whatever. Like, how do you feel about people who like now pay for like upwards of like $20 for bone broth and like, you know, goji beers are like the new trend food. Like I, because to me, half of me feels like, oh, this is a great gateway into like Asian food. But the other half of me is like, y'all call this food weird and smelly before like (laughs) yeah yeah I mean I think it's it's hard I I was talking about this I feel like I talk about this a lot and so like there I have so many thoughts I'll just try I'll try to condense them and make it um I think one like I guess generally it's a good thing that there's like mainstream appeal it's good that things are getting more popular and it's good that people you know there's eyeballs on it however I think that it's like fundamentally upsetting that a when food is used as clickbait because it's a trend and then it's basically something you can like you know you can dispose of at your leisure this is like why native americans are not happy when you like put on um those like huge kind of like the ceremonial mm-hmm. like um headgear mm-hmm. and for halloween right it's the same thing it's like our culture isn't at isn't some a costume that you can wear and it's the same thing with food it's not like oh i'm just gonna put some soy sauce in this and being like oh it's kind of chinese now like that's just crazy um so I think that's a big problem of like how do you actually generate media and interest in it and it's in the way that's not like trendy it's like just appreciation Mm -hmm. so that at some points when I've received for instance when I receive like things back from editors that I pitch when I'm writing like oh we already did an Asian angle so we don't want to cover it again like I hear that all the time And that's like, oh, so then there's like a quota system for like how much um, like Asian stuff you can cover, but you can cover like dumb, crappy American food for the rest of the year, (laughs) right? Like, it's like, what, like, what is that balance? Like, what is, is Asian American food, not American food? So like, there's that situation going on. And then it's, I really do feel like if you're going to, if you're from a different culture and you're cooking that culture's food, then you do, as a chef, you do have a responsibility to be doing something for that culture as well. Like, and that something can be different for everyone, but it's like, how, how are you taking someone else's food, but you're not giving back at all? You're just profiting off it, Mm -hmm. like is innately, of course, going to rub people the wrong way. And it's innately just disrespectful. So like, 
for all the white male chefs that have like, oh, suddenly become like Mexican chefs or, you know, Thai chefs or whatever, like, well, what, like, what, what are you doing to really help that culture besides like talk about the food sometimes or Mm -hmm. like just whitewash their food and make it more palatable to like these different audiences. Like, so that's a whole another conversation we can have for like 10 hours um (laughs) you know and I and it's not just like white people to Asian people either it's like look at David Chang he literally became famous making Japanese food and he is an asshole you know and so I think it's just it's like it's a it's complicated is that okay because he's Asian so like Asians can steal each other's things but we can't steal it but other people can't steal our things like what does that mean right so Mm -hmm. like there's a lot of there's a lot to unravel there. And I think like it's, it is okay that there are people I'm sure who made fun of others for having like gross lunches um, when they were young and now they've learned better. But like, I would like to hope that those people learn better because they actually came to appreciate and understand the food versus like, Oh, matcha is cool. So I guess I like matcha now. Like, how do you, there's an intellectual, I think um, depth that I hope that, people actually have when they're addressing new, the cultures of, the cultures and the foods of different cultures mm-hmm. nowadays but it's honestly like you just can't expect that for all people yeah yeah so like I grew up in San Francisco most of my life lived in LA for the last two to three years almost um and right now I'm based in Helsinki and even in Helsinki like there's this oh cool yeah it's been it's been really interesting so far it's now getting way too dark too often now but oh no (laughs) yeah um but even here in Helsinki there's kind of a wave of interest in and especially Chinese food but each city that I've kind of had the experience of living in has such different like Asian food scenes do you think there's a growing future for like the Asian food scene in the next five years or do you think it's just all hype right now or I mean I think it's there's definitely a lot more that needs to be explored with Asian cuisine I think people are starting to realize I mean it's there's like a good good, significant majority no I don't know if it's a majority but yeah yeah a majority of the world is Asian (laughs) so like obviously there's a lot to unravel there in terms of like what people are eating Mm -hmm. but also I mean, personally, I just find that a lot of, like, American, the American palette and, like, also a lot of the Western European palette is somewhat bland. Yeah. Like, that's a generalization. There's, there are pockets that are not bland. Like, you know, so, like, Creole cuisine is great. Yeah. But um, <laughs> but I think we all know why that is. I think, like, people are starting to be like, oh, there's, like, all these flavors. Like, I'm, as people also become, like, more progressive and, like, liberal and the younger population, they like want to explore. They don't actually want to be confined to the same old stuff Mm -hmm. that um, maybe felt comfortable for their parents. So I think with that becomes a lot of like interest in Asian flavors and Asian cuisine and traveling to Asia. And, you know, that's like a virtuous cycle. Yeah. Kind of speaking about like the future generation of Asian Americans and the culinary world. The reason why I started this podcast was mainly because there's like a young generation of Asian Americans that have all this technology now in high school that I never had. For Asian American kids who are like now exploring other creative career paths and maybe interested in, in pursuing culinary, do you have any advice for them on kind of how to navigate the world right now? Um, I think it's, it's for people who want to go into something creative in general, I would say like, you just have to do it. And like, you constantly are finding like, what does creativity like mean for you? And sometimes I think people are like, oh, if I go into food, that's creative. But I would argue like, there's plenty of people not doing creative things in food um, that are going in and making the same thing over and over again. Mm -hmm. Like look at every new American restaurant in New York right now. (laughs) Like, you know, um, there's like, there's definitely ways you can get caught in a rut. And I think what's more important to teach like the, the younger generation that's coming up and trying to find their way is like figure out what, what kind of creativity like makes you excited and try to apply that to like different things that hopefully some can make you money and some can't. But, like, what is it that makes you feel creative? For me, like, I like to work with my hands. And, like, I cook, obviously. And so cooking has to be, like, actually cooking, not, like, 
styling or not like writing Mm -hmm. you know those are also food related careers like actually cooking um a certain type of food also like I don't like to cook in volume I don't I like to make certain types of plates like those are the things those are my confines of like how where I feel the most creative and then I also like to do pottery and I I'm not invested in that to make any money but it's like that's how I can be creative and take a break from my other creative thing um so yeah just like kind of finding finding that create like source of creativity versus saying like oh I'm creative and I want to go into food and then just thinking that like um an industry can be creative I guess Mm -hmm. um versus like certain tasks yeah and it kind of sounds like at least along your way you've been able to highlight like your own different strengths and weaknesses and kind of make it your own thing right like nothing is ever really predefined the way it is forever right Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think especially growing up like thinking okay the safe routes right traditionally are doctor lawyer accountant whatever Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know obviously you moved away from management consulting and and doing your MBA into something that like fulfills you a little bit more right and it's it's probably hard to explain that, but like, it just feels better. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, for management consulting, I think that's an easy one. Like I, like it was like a soul crushing, totally worthless job. (laughs) Uh, I don't know what half man, half of the management consultants are doing. And I was a management consultant. So I still feel very entitled to say that. Like I literally did nothing. Like I did, I like physically did things like tactically, like made PowerPoints, but like, literally what use did they do for the world like absolutely nothing yeah and like I actually listened to a really interesting my favorite podcast is called hidden brain and they had an episode called bullshit jobs where like tons of people worldwide are like will say like I think my job is total bullshit I don't think I contribute anything to the world and you hear it from people from accountants to paramedics which I'm like uh. oh. but like tons of people feel this way about their job and like that is what I was afraid of waking up and feeling this like bone crushing like literally I could fall off the cliff tomorrow and literally nobody would care and my job would just like disappear and it wouldn't have mattered because I wasn't doing anything anyway yeah. like that's a horrible thing to feel um so I I don't wish that upon anyone like I think it was it's not I know it's scary to like leave a comfortable job, but like, I think it's scarier to think about what happens as you continue down the path of the comfortable job. Yeah, totally. And like, I, I have grown into the mindset now because like, I think I've tried doing the safe route, like in accounting and it just didn't work out for me. And I grew into the mindset of when I'm on my deathbed, no one's going to come rushing by my side and be like, hey, remember the extra 10 hours you put in on that day? Yeah, we really yeah. appreciate it, right? Yeah, exactly. That was so great. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Angie. <laughs> One of the other questions I had for you, obviously you've done so many different kinds of collaborations and, and artistic projects and working with tech companies, Fortune 500 companies, local organizations, nonprofits. Out of all these projects and collaborations, if you could pick the top three memorable ones what would they be and why oh um that's a good question I mean um if I can pick both like paid and unpaid things yeah. I guess um paid wise I've been wor- been working with an appliance brand called Dash for years now um, we published two books together um I've done tons of like everything from development to like some product stuff to you know food and books and anyway um mm-hmm. and that has been because it's, it's been such a long time client I've had a really good time learning about myself and also having a pretty safe and and paid space to try on new things like that was the first place I ever did food styling mm. um and like I actually don't really like food styling but like it does pay well and I do it occasionally if it, it makes sense um and I just like learned a lot about like why don't I like this you know what I mean um mm-hmm. sometimes how do you know you don't like something unless you actually go and do it like I don't really like being a barista but I didn't know until I was a barista for a few months and I was like yeah. mm, people are so mean to baristas for no reason that's <laughs> oh, like, no I don't know why um but yeah so like I thought that was like a, just a really beneficial relationship in terms of me growing as a professional as a person um as a photographer as a stylist um and also like as a recipe developer like I they have a pretty 
set kind of audience, like very American, kind of like Midwest, you know, the, the same audience really is like Scripps Network. Um, mm-hmm. And developing recipes for them were hard. And also like, for me, learning that fine line of like, what am I comfortable with? There's definitely some recipes I'm like, ooh, this is a Thai recipe, but it's not really Thai. Like I did that a few years ago. And now I'm like, I don't know if I would do that today, you know? And like, that's a learning process. We're not perfect. You make mistakes and like, it's kind of good to be able to say like, hmm, like what did I learn from that experience or having done that now? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think there's definitely like a benefit to kind of doing like a career switching of sorts, right? Like, I, I think because I used to be so obsessed about like, okay, here's like the one path for me and I should follow that. I think a lot of it's like kind of like high school or university training, right? You're taught to like, okay, if you want to major in this, here are the classes to take. And here's how you get like better and better in advance and whatnot and your diploma. But in the real world, like, and so much more complex than that. And I think it's amazing that you've been able to navigate all these different projects and kind of like, take away from all these experiences to like build something that you're a part of right now right at this stage mm-hmm. I, I think the big thing is like I always feel like there's something or like that I guess this goes back to what we were talking about earlier is like they're always feeling like there's like something else that I should be doing or learning and like I think that it's it is sad to me because I think we've all been there. If you've been in a corporate job, you know, when you go into the job, you're all excited because it's a new job. You try to make all these changes and then you feel like everybody's just saying no to you because they don't want to make changes because Mm -hmm. they just want everything to like chod like along forever. This in the same way. And it's like, just like intellectual laziness. Mm -hmm. And like, I think for that's just like a microcosm of it in a work environment. But like, I think a lot of people unfortunately fall into that trap in their life. Like it's just like, you just have kids and then you like go do something else or you have another kid and then you like I don't know like get a few promotions and you buy like three houses and like you know and it's like well what are things that you are like actively learning or trying to get better at or like a new hot it doesn't have to be like a crazy new hobby that you decide to change your career to but like a new hobby or set some goals for yourself like I think those are the things that like keep life interesting or having a shared experience with your partner that is different Um, We went mushroom hunting the other day and we were terrible, but like now we've done it and now we kind of want to go again. And it's like, I don't know, just, um, I just bought the Noma book on fermentation, which is a lot larger than I thought it would be. It's huge. Um, And I'm like, oh, I'm really excited to like learn about this because I'm a chef, but I don't, I know I have very, very precursory knowledge on fermentation. And like, this is something I should be like, learning is the best is like the point of life. I I Mm -hmm. personally believe so. Yeah. Yeah. It's a super random question. Do you watch Rick and Morty? I don't. Oh, no. Okay. Well, (laughs) like, there's no requirement for everyone to, like, have the two kids and the white picket fence and, like, the nice home and the car, right? There's no requirement for that because your life is your life. Uh, There's this one episode in Rick and Morty where it's basically, like, a crazy science science fiction show um, about, like, a crazy scientist and dragging his nephew on like dangerous adventures and they go to this arcade that's like located somewhere in space so like all these aliens are playing different games that aren't on earth and one of them is called Roy and the like the aim of the game in this in this Roy game is that you just play this character named Roy you start off as like a boy and you just grow up and you can choose whether he like becomes a manager of a company or not you know you can basically go through these life paths and like it's just the most boring existence (laughs) in video game and like you get points for like whether or not you have like a 401k at the end of your life life. it's a really good episode if you if you ever have time to like chill that's like number one episode for me (laughs) okay okay cool (laughs) that sounds awesome and like yeah it's like black mirror but not scary yeah exactly (laughs) it's like really really... real but not scary (laughs) oh yeah yeah and the show's like definitely a lot more stupid than than black mirror so oh man I, we're kind of like winding down to the end of the interview. I'm like basically running out of questions. Um, obviously, because you you have so many different projects going on and you juggle so many different things. Like, what do you like to do when you're like, when you want to chill out, relax and just like not think about it? Or do you always think about your projects? 
Um, no, I mean, I definitely try. I for the I've really been trying to stick to like a not doing stuff on weekends policy. I mean, obviously that doesn't really work out because sometimes there's events on weekends. But then I'll try to take like two days after the event or something like that, and just like not check my email and not do things or like whatever. Um, so usually when I'm not doing anything, um, I like to like do other things on like I have like a list of places that I want to eat or like a list of activities that I want to do like I'm really into feeling like I did certain things just for me like going Mm -hmm. on this mushroom walk that we did like two weeks ago like I like I that was like not useful for anything well we got some (laughs) mushrooms but they weren't very tasty um (laughs) and like that was just because like I wanted to do it and I feel like it's really important to feel like I did this because like there was no other reason besides I wanted to do it because I you have like I'm the most important person in my life, you know, like I have to take care of myself. Um, My husband comes in a close second, but I am (laughs) the most important person, you know? So like, um, and I have to like, make sure that like, I have to take care of myself. And I don't know, it's, it's a struggle of trying to figure out what that means sometimes. And sometimes it's like, I want to go take a walk. So I'll go to the park with my dog and that's it. Like, it doesn't have to be a grandiose thing, but yeah, I'm just trying to, reserve space for myself yeah and that's so important too like even for me I I get caught up in just like lacking in self-care that I could take the time to like invest in right so like on the days where I'm feeling like super anxious or super stressed like it should be a good reminder to be like wait I'm the most important person here like right now on this earth to Mm -hmm. me in my life right like just take like a five minute breather to like meditate or watch stupid tv or go out for a walk like whatever Whatever. yeah yeah whatever makes you happy because it's like no one's gonna do it for you exactly and then what's the point of like running making yourself unhappy for other people like Mm -hmm. exactly because they're not more important than you are yeah um how long have you been running the podcast uh not very long I only had the well I had the idea for about a year now So like my boyfriend works in the video game industry and he was at an event, like an esports event in LA. So I went with him and it was like a live taped audience show. And I had met this Taiwanese American kid who was like, he actually ended up winning in that game, won a huge amount of prize money. And after the show, you know, finished taping, we all hung out afterwards, kind of like a wrap up party thing. So this kid who had just won, you know, flew in from Pittsburgh and met all these other kids who were interested in the same game. But when I talked to his mom, his mom was like, no, he's not going to do this anymore. And I'm like, what do you mean? Like, oh, no, like, I, I don't want him to continue in video games. You know, he, he has why, like, why? I think, <laughs> like, I think she, she thought games were silly. You don't pursue games. Like there's nothing in it. Right. right. You just, it's not a profession that's like respectable. Right. <laughs> And I, I wasn't trying to argue with her, but I was trying to calmly tell her, like, well, there are so many video game companies now that require software engineers, computer scientists, like, even if he's not a video gamer, like, there's still, like, a technical need for people to go into video games, even artists, right, and designers. There's also and- a lot of people making money playing video games. <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> Literally. That's, that's your angle. Yeah. Yeah. So- yeah so you know she kind of bought it but not really right and she was like oh yeah yeah maybe but I think that was what kind of spawned the idea for this podcast was like this kid had access to reddit a whole wealth of information on the internet for him to feel lonely in Pittsburgh and to always be around his parents and like kind of a tiger mom figure Mm -hmm. and I was like oh man I saw so much of myself in that kid I kind of wanted to create this podcast to like talk to other Asian Americans who do other things that was just something I never grew up with like I didn't know what other career paths there were really yeah I think Mm -hmm. it's like so important to see a representation that like Asian Americans can do a lot of things and be a lot of types of people and some Mm -hmm. of them are like you know Asian Americans can be like bad people too and like just being like the whole point of individualism um is like that you can be an individual like there's no there's literally no like there's no ifs or when like it's like that's just it and being like oh that that person who's asian american doing x thing like doesn't actually reflect on me they just are another person and i'm free to do 
cool at like whatever I am and I'm not being compared to them because we're not the same like if I play video games but that other person is a lawyer like that doesn't make him better than me because we're literally different yeah exactly. just feeling yeah feeling the acceptance to actually do that from the community and from your parents I think and sometimes you just can't get it from your parents I never got it from mm-hmm. my parents and like mm-hmm. just being able to say I'm gonna still go be a person despite this yeah even for me I still struggle with that trying to just remember my life is like my own path and I think social acceptance is like unfortunately one of the core values of like being an Asian American (laughs) like I don't know at least for me like I've always I've always had to kind of look for social acceptance in order to somehow feel better for myself and it's like totally not the case I know that but I still have to remind myself about that yeah I mean I think we're all kind of like wired to want social acceptance but then like being in an Asian American community I feel like it's like it's even more so because there's such a lack of um, emphasis on uh, like being your own person and like Mm -hmm. that is not seen as a good thing so then it's like how good you are is only how much people think you are good at things or Mm -hmm. accept you as who as who you are so you're always trying to like be a different person for everyone else's sake yeah yeah well thank you so much for your time of course thank you for having me 